Life Audio. The gospel is this idea that God created mankind to be righteous, but instead mankind has gone after many, many other schemes. Like, this is essentially the problem of human nature. This is your problem, and this is my problem. The problem that we have is that we were built for righteousness, but sin entered in and created brokenness beyond repair, and it has caused us to seek out many different schemes to make ourselves feel okay. Hello, my friends. Welcome back to How to Study the Bible. I am your host, Nicole Eunice, and I am so glad to be with you today. And I'm just feeling very grateful for each one of you. It's a beautiful spring-like day here in Virginia, and I had a chance to ride my bike to work here to, to record this podcast. And as I was outside taking in life and the world, I just was so grateful for faithful seekers and believers who want to study the Bible together and in the midst of a world that can feel chaotic and crazy or dark that we do have an anchor for our soul, that we do have a foundation that we can build our life upon, and that God is not surprised by anything that we're experiencing, and God is inviting us to deeper places of growth and maturity with Him. And we get to do that together. We get to discover and follow Jesus together, and it's really a gift. So I'm grateful for you and grateful for the series that we're in in the book of Ecclesiastes, which we're going to get into in just a minute. As always, I want to thank you guys for your reviews and for liking the podcast, for sharing it with your friends. I think there's a wonderful way to care for someone if you hear something that reminds you of them or that you think would be encouraging to them and you share that with them in a text message or on your socials or whatever. I just think it's a great way to be encouraging and to spur one another on to good deeds. So thank you for doing that. Thank you for growing our community here on How to Say the Bible. I also want to let you guys know that if you don't know, I do a weekly newsletter, just a free short newsletter called Real Talk. And it's a very brief reflection. It's a question. It's a piece of inspiration and a coaching tip to kind of move your life forward because we know that it's just, it takes intention to live your life with joy and freedom. So I want to give you a couple of tools toward that joy and freedom so you can find that newsletter at NicoleUnis.com slash Real Talk and you can sign up for it there and I'll come to your inbox every Wednesday. So anyway, it also helps you know what's kind of going on with the podcast. So would love to see you over there. Okay. Hi, I'm Beckett Cook, host of The Beckett Cook Show. I lived as a gay man in Hollywood for many, many years until I had a radical encounter with Jesus 13 years ago. Since then, I've gotten my master's degree in seminary and published a book called A Change of Affection. On my podcast, The Beckett Cook Show, I sit down with fascinating Christian scholars and thinkers to address the lies of the culture and bring the biblical truth to bear on those lies. To start listening now, go to lifeaudio.com or search for The Becca Cook Show on your favorite podcasting platform. We are going to continue in our series in the book of Ecclesiastes, and I just want to return to what we're focusing on throughout this book as we study. And this is the big question that we kind of set out at the beginning of the book of Ecclesiastes. The question was, how do we make sense of a dark and broken and complicated world? in light of God's promises and goodness. And Ecclesiastes does not pull punches. The teacher, the preacher, the guy who's addressing the assembly, we think that it is Solomon, is basically explaining his own experience of coming to wisdom, of what he believes about God, and also is just being super honest about the hardships and the reality of the world and how do we engage in that. And we're kind of continuing in that vein today. We're going to be in Ecclesiastes chapter 7. And we're going to look at a few just varying thoughts. In a lot of ways, these are kind of points of wisdom or reflections or observations about the world that the preacher is making. And I want to break them into three concepts that the preacher addresses here in Ecclesiastes 7. The first one is the role of sadness in our life. The second one is conflict and the reality of people. And the third one is, what is true righteousness? <laughs> so a, a variety of thoughts, right? I mean, in many ways, when I'm in Ecclesiastes, I'm like, mm, deep thoughts. I need to 
lay down in the grass and look at the clouds for a while. But it's great because it draws us into deeper places. And we live in a world right now and in a culture that is all about a superficial, quick fix, like just help me get to the solution for today that I need so that I can move on with my life. And I think we're we're reaping the results of that, which is like generally an anxious, depressed, despairing people, because we're, we're lacking that anchor and that depth. And Ecclesiastes is certainly an invitation into that depth in a way that I think is very engaging with the reality of the world. So I'm going to read portions of each part of these, and then we're going to work through what does this say? And what is the backstory? What does it mean for us? Let's start in Ecclesiastes 7 verses 2 through 5. Here's what the preacher has to say. It is better to go to a house of mourning than to go to a house of feasting. For death is the destiny of everyone. The living should take this to heart. Frustration is better than laughter because a sad face is good for the heart. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of pleasure. It is better to heed the rebuke of a wise person than to listen to the song of fools. Okay, so we enter into this and we ask, okay, what does it say? And often we see this dichotomy set up between two different kinds of living, right? And in this dichotomy that appears over and over again as a theme in Ecclesiastes, we have wiseness and foolishness, like what leads to wisdom and what leads to foolishness. And this is where Ecclesiastes started. Remember, the preacher said, I tried to find life in great works. I tried to find life in great pleasure. I tried to find life and just pursuing everything that would make me feel good, right? And what really brings wisdom? And this first aspect is kind of offering us this countercultural idea that I think is very true, which is what actually helps us grow as people. And the reality is pleasure and good times, if you ask 100 people, when did you grow the most in your life? Did you grow the most through pleasure, peace, and good times? Or did you grow the most through hard times? I think almost all of us would say we don't want hard times and we don't like hard times, but we grow the most in hard times. And if you read through this idea of like, it's better to be in a house of mourning, it's better to be there than in a house of feasting. Death is everyone's destiny and the living should take this to heart. Okay, that's morbid, right? Like that's how we feel in our culture. But but we have to ask ourselves a question. Is it true, though? It's like, yeah, it's absolutely true. Death is absolutely the destiny of everyone. We are all 100% terminal, as Christine Kane says. Like, we are all headed in the same direction. And what the preacher is saying is that when you take that to heart, you actually number your days rightly. If you are real with yourself about life and death, you will live a better life. And if you're real with yourself about what sadness teaches you, if you listen to your heart about what sadness teaches you, it will move you toward greater purpose. Oftentimes when we experience sadness, there is loss and mourning, and there's often sometimes injustice within sadness as well. And so when we engage the sadness, a lot of times it can be a signpost for the purposes that God has for us to bring him glory. The things that move our heart are often the places that God is calling us to action. I was just on a call last week with a organization that I work with here in Richmond, and we were talking about some young students and the path that their life has taken them on when they've been in a place where they're encouraged and supported and affirmed or when they're not in that place. And it impacted me so deeply, like just listening to the stories of these young students. And I had that moment of remembering, you know, when we feel sad, when we feel frustrated, when we mourn, Oftentimes, God is pointing us toward a purpose, a a, a way that he's calling us to be activated in this world. And true wisdom is realizing, first of all, we're not going to be activated in every single area, but that absolutely God has called you to purpose and he's called you to give and use the talents that he's given you toward a purpose, toward advancing the kingdom of heaven. And so, yeah, wisdom often comes out of places of sadness because we're in a world that often tries to deny or suppress or numb away sadness, we can miss the depth and the wisdom that God can bring us to when we are able to sit with God in our sadness. We're able to listen to our sadness and let God teach us in that sadness. And if you're in a place like that, go to the Psalms, spend time reading through, just pick a Psalm a day and read through it, make it your own, 
because God is near and present to us when we are real about our suffering and our sadness. I think that's what we can gain from this first part of Ecclesiastes. Okay, second part. Now we move on and the tone kind of changes, right? And we we enter into this idea of how do we live well in relationship with people? Let me read you verses 8 and 9 and 21 and 22. The end of a matter is better than the beginning, and patience is better than pride. Do not be quickly provoked in your spirit, for anger resides in the lap of fools. Do not pay attention to every word people say, or you may hear your servant cursing you, for you know in your heart that many times you yourself have cursed others. Oh, <laughs> preacher, coming in hot. So here we turn our attention to what does it look like to actually be good with other people? Like, how do we be in relationship with other people? In the beginning, verses eight and nine, we hear this like, hey, set an intention for what you want to have come out of conflict. The end of a matter is better than at the beginning. Being patient is better than being prideful. Not being quickly provoked is going to lead to a better response. This well, this does not require much interpretation, guys. Like, what that meant when this was written many, many years ago is the same thing that it means today. And it's absolutely still true. Human nature is still the same. But how often we get caught up in being right, being heard, being the one who gets our way, and we can miss the reality of like, hey, what is the purpose of this conflict? What is the best result that's going to come out of this conflict? And what the preacher says is, hey, the the end of this is better than being in the middle of it. Like, you want to get to the end of it. You want to get to the place where you've not been provoked, where you've been patient, where you've pursued goodness and oneness with this conflict, right? And then it kind of goes on. And I, I combined this with an end piece of the chapter because I feel like these two are actually linked, where it talks about in 21 and 22, we hear this idea of like, hey, and also take it light on what people say about you. Why are Christians always so serious? I'm Barnabas Piper of the Happy Rant Podcast, where we take Jesus seriously, but not too much else. Subscribe at lifeaudio.com. Like, don't listen to everything that's being said, particularly about you, because you may hear some bad things, right? And it may be helpful for you to remember that you yourself have spoken poorly about other people. Like, this is just naming reality. It's just, it's helping us level set, hey, we live in a broken, complicated world. The people around you are broken, complicated people. And the person that you see in the mirror every day is also a broken, complicated person. So with that in mind, how then do you want to enter into relationship? And we get these very quick takeaways that I'm sure one of them applies to you today. <laughs> like The takeaway may be, are you focused on getting to the resolution or are you focused on being right when it comes to a conflict? How are you doing with your anger? Are you easily provoked? How are you doing with your patience? Are you showing up with a spirit of listening, with a spirit of desiring to understand? And how are you doing with forgiving and letting go of things that you may hear or experience from a person? Because guess what? You do that to people too. Like, it's just very clear. I'm like relationships 101 right here in Ecclesiastes. And this is all remember in the framework of what does it look like to be a wise person? Somebody needed to hear that today. And that somebody is me. So I am taking something away for sure on how I want to apply that even in my conversations today in my family and friendships. Okay, part three, last part. And this one's a little tricky. To be honest with you, I would have rather skipped over it. But I'm like, no, the people want to do Ecclesiastes. So we're going to do difficult Bible interpretation. I think it's super actually important that we do this because you will, if you, if you think it's always easy, like part two is easy, right? We just read it, what it says about human nature. It's true. We can apply it to our lives easy. But there are times and places in scripture that are pretty complicated, pretty hard to discern and they feel sort of mysterious. Sometimes they feel in conflict with other things that we know. And so we're like, ah, oh, what do we do with this? It's very easy to want to skip over those sections or explain them away or let them get you really torqued up and confused about your faith. So I want to engage in one because it can help us do what we call hermeneutics, which is Bible interpretation. How do we do Bible interpretation when we read something that might be difficult? So this is our last section, section three, Ecclesiastes 7, verses 27 through 29. 
Look, says the teacher. So we've got a little transition here. Look, says the teacher. This is what I have discovered. Adding one thing to another to discover the scheme of things while I was still searching but not finding. I found one upright man among a thousand, but not one upright woman among them all. This only have I found. God created mankind upright, but they have gone in search of many schemes. Okay. So the teacher says, hey, I'm going to give you a axiom. I'm going to give you a truth that I've discovered. And the truth that he's discovered is this concept of who is righteous. And there's been places already throughout Ecclesiastes where this idea of who is righteous has been hit upon. It was actually just hit upon in verse 20. It says there's no one on earth who is righteous, no one who does what is right and never sins. Okay. And that's actually a theme that we see throughout scripture. So when we start thinking about biblical interpretation, we're going to look for themes that we see throughout scripture. That's why interpretation is the most difficult part of your Bible study, because especially if you're new to scripture, you might not have a lot of built in knowledge, like Bible knowledge from beginning to end, which is another reason why I say every person who's a follower of Jesus needs to have read the Bible from beginning to end at least once, hopefully multiple times you've read through it because Only by reading through it can you kind of glean some of the bigger themes so that when we get to a little tricky section, we can be like, okay, I'm going to I'm able to interpret this section in light of like the mega themes across the whole Bible. So a mega theme across the whole Bible is that there is no one righteous. Now, we read in 27, 28 and 29 what I just read to you where the teacher says, this is what I've discovered. Okay, so one thing I want to point out to you, especially if you're not reading in your own scripture is that this next part is set apart like a poem. So it's it's typed out like a poem, okay? So now we're entering into this sort of analogy, a living metaphor. And the teacher says, adding one thing to another to discover. So I'm looking, I'm searching. And what I've found is that I can find one upright man among a thousand, but not one upright woman among them all. Okay, so immediately, if you're reading this, and particularly maybe if you're a female, you're like, ho, 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 ho hold the phone. Is this guy saying that like some men are righteous, but no women are righteous? Is that what this is saying? And you should ask those questions. It should absolutely provoke you to ask that question. Whenever we have a question like that, we're going to ask the question and we're going to say, what does, how does this stand up in light of the rest of scripture? Okay. So what we know is that in verse 20, the teacher just said, there is no one on earth who is righteous. Okay. So when we read 27 and 28, and he says, well, I found one upright man among a thousand, but not one upright woman among them all. Okay, those two things contradict, right? Because on one hand, he's saying there's no no one's righteous. And then this one's like, okay, I found one. And then you have to read the next part, okay? This only have I found, okay? The only thing I found is that God created mankind upright, but they have gone in search of many schemes. So the point of the passage is not to say, there are no such thing as women who are righteous. The point of the passage is not to say, hey, one in 1,000 men are righteous. <laughs> the point of the passage is actually to say, nobody's righteous. There's, there's no such thing. And we have to ask ourselves, well, then why is it written that way? Well, it might be written that way to kind of draw out this idea of righteousness is so rare already. It might be a literary technique that the the teacher's using to gather up a statement of wisdom, right? But what we do know is there's nowhere in scripture that says that women are morally inferior to men. There's there's no place that ever says that women are morally inferior, like something about women is more broken, is more broken than men. What it does say in scripture is that everyone is broken beyond repair. So it doesn't actually matter. Like if we're broken beyond repair, and a man is broken into 10 parts and a woman's broken into 15, just for the sake of the argument, it doesn't matter because both are broken beyond repair. It it doesn't make it easier to repair either one if they're broken beyond repair. And what we know is that overall in scripture, what we see from Genesis to Revelation is that there is no one righteous. And in many ways, this passage in Ecclesiastes can actually be really hopeful because it's like, oh, here we see the, the gospel is being preached in this passage because The gospel is this idea that God created mankind to be righteous, but instead mankind has gone after many, many other schemes. Like this is essentially the problem of human nature. This is your problem and this is my problem. The problem that we have is that we were built for righteousness, but sin entered in 
and created brokenness beyond repair. And it has caused us to seek out many different schemes to make ourselves feel okay. And isn't it cool that in this wisdom literature written thousands of years before Jesus's life and ministry, we already see the gospel. The evidence of the gospel is coming out in the midst of this sometimes like dark and depressing book. Like we get this kind of middle thought like, ooh, this is the main thing. Okay, so to review where we've been in this chapter as we wrap up right now, what does it mean? First, allow the hard things to teach you to number your days. That's from the sadness part. Number two, engage reality about yourself and others because this is true humility. This is the beginning of wisdom. Engage reality. That was all those possible applications that you can take into your relationships. And then the final one is this, the message of the gospel rings throughout scripture and Jesus is our answer. I want to close with just this passage from Romans 5 to consider as we think about this idea that the the preacher has laid out for us that there's no one upright, but we were created for righteousness, yet we've gone in search of many schemes. And listen to what it says in Romans chapter 5. It says, just as one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people, this is from Genesis, just as sin entered the world, so also one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people. For just as through the disobedience of one man, many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. This is the gift of our Jesus who came and offered his life in righteousness and obedience so that we also can be made righteous. Amen, everyone. See you next week. How to Study the Bible with Nicole Eunice is a production of Life Audio and Salem Media. If you like what you heard today, please take a second to rate and review the podcast in your favorite podcast app so that more listeners like you can find the show. For more faith-filled, inspirational podcasts, visit us at lifeaudio.com. Christians should be serious about our faith. But does that mean we need to be serious people all the time? Especially in a world of weird, absurd stuff? And even when Christian culture gets crazy? I'm Barnabas Piper of the Happy Ramp Podcast, where we cheerfully rant about pop culture, church culture, work, creativity, life, and just about everything. But we take Jesus seriously. Listen and subscribe at lifeaudio.com.